Good morning, everybody. Yes, let's try that one more time. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Fantastic. Um, I want to just first take a moment to really thank ACAMS. I think, you know, I've been um, involved in ACAMS for uh, at least 13 years now. Um, and increasingly, I've seen uh, ACAMS continue to be dedicated uh, to this movement, and that's the movement to fight human trafficking. Um, and this conference, um, this morning's introduction, uh, and this conversation is proof positive of that. Um, if I think about really empowering uh, and effective movements to actually get to the point where we can eradicate this terrible, vile um, thing that's in our world today, I think about it in three stages. Um, know, do, and change. You have to know about the problem. You have to know how it exists. Tamia being here, activists, survivors, continuing to tell their story and to share their information is how we know and ACAMS continues to support that. Do, through all of the initiatives, the collaborations, the continued conversations with law enforcement, nonprofits, and financial institutions, um, becomes a key, key player and ingredient in being able to succeed. And then, together, we can change. So I am so honored to be a part of this conversation and so honored to um, be used to, to try to help continue that fight. Um, and I am even more honored to be introducing this fantastic panel um, to have a discussion about the extremely wicked, shockingly evil, and vile uh, human trafficking specifically in the US. And I could not think of a more appropriate place to have that conversation. Um, let me first introduce this panel, and typically, um, you know, I wouldn't belabor the introductions, but I think it's really important to understand who we have sitting at, on this stage, I was going to say at the table, but this, this, uh, this stage. Um, first in alphabetical order, uh, Roy Austin. Um, he is a partner at Harris Wiltshire Grannis. Uh, he started his career at the Justice Department Civil Rights Division as a trial attorney, investigating and prosecuting hate crimes, police brutality around the country, and was appointed Deputy Assistant Attorney General. Um, he went to private practice and worked on racial profiling lawsuits. He joined the DC US Attorney's Office as a sex crimes, homicide, and public corruption prosecutor, uh, and, was, and, and as the Human Trafficking Task Force Coordinator. Um, he wa became Obama White House's deputy assistant to the president for the Office of Urban Affairs, Justice and Opportunity, where he led policy efforts concerning criminal justice reform, civil rights, and human services. Um, and he serves on my brother's keeper task force. Um, and he's going to be here to talk to us about one of the first federally prosecuted human trafficking cases that he worked on. Um, Next to him at the end, uh, Dr. James Cocaine, you already heard uh, Rohit talk about him, um, the director of the United Nations University Center for Policy Research, um, and he's been serving with the UNU since 2013. Um, he has a long history of really focusing on policy um, and on how we can think about how to change and reform social injustices. Um, he uh, formed the code of ethics that now binds the president of the UN General Assembly, um, advised to the senior UN leaders on digital privacy, internet governance, cybersecurity, all very important topics of conversation as we think about human trafficking, and we'll be talking about a little bit today. Um, he previously served as a senior fellow in the International Peace Institute. Um, he was direct co-director, Center of Global Counterterrorism Cooperation. Um, the list truly goes on, counterterrorism in Africa, um, and as advisory uh, on the advisory board of the Journal of Modern Slavery. Um, next to me, uh, we have Jane Kardakovsky. <laughs> um, she is the human trafficking finance specialist in the money laundering and asset recovery section in the criminal division of the Department of Justice. I'm going to pause there for a second because um, Jane's going to talk about exactly what that means and how pivotal that is, I think, for us as a country um, because I think this is the first time we have said financial crimes must be a part of human trafficking prosecutions. And so Jane will talk about that um, as part of our discussion. Um, she investigates and prosecutes human trafficking cases with an emphasis on financial investigations uh, and assists and advises the U.S. Attorney's Office's federal, state, and local law enforcement, as well as financial institutions in those cases. 
Um, she advises on forfeiture and restitution uh, for victims in human trafficking cases. Before that, she was an assistant district attorney in the Rackets Bureau of the New York County DA's office, where she investigated and prosecuted enterprise corruption, larceny, and tax fraud cases, um, and has really dedicated her life to that as well. Um, last but certainly not least, Mr. Rick Small, most of you probably know who he is and probably needs no introduction, but um, I think, you know, when we were putting together this panel, we thought about who the speakers should be, um, and Rick is one of these people who um, is constantly, quietly in the background supporting these initiatives, um, pushing people to think about the issues, pushing financial institutions, nonprofits, other initiatives to think about how financial institutions can actually be effective and impactful in this space. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna leave it at that because with his 35 years of experience, both in public and private sector, um, at the DOJ, at the Fed, being really at the core of um, the BSA and the USA Patriot Act, and I think we used to joke around at Amex that he was the person who wrote the SAR rule. <laughs> we have it straight from the source here of how we can actually impact and affect change um, in the landscape that, that we face here, specifically with anti-financial crimes. I know that it took a little bit longer to introduce this panel than to normal, but um, these are the people and types of people that we need to have represented during these conversations, including the survivor voice as well. So, so important. Um, and then having you all here, of course, is, is the next key, key um, ingredient. Um, I'm going to encourage you, please, and reiterate what Kieran said. Take out your mobile devices. I have a lot of things on my lap right now, but one of them is the iPad, um, which will tell me what questions you have. Um, so please take out your, your devices, go to the conference app, and submit questions um, for this panel as we continue to have that discussion. Um, thank you. So without further ado, I'm going to kick it over to Roy to have um, kind of to tell us a bit. I'm going to skip through some of the slides here because I think um, Rohit touched upon a lot of that. Um, I will recognize that this is the 20th year anniversary of the TVPA, which made human trafficking a crime in the US. Um, these are just some statistics that I think we need to be very aware of as we think about this issue. Um, the U.S. was named among one of the worst places in 2018 for human trafficking. Um, since for the last 11 years, Polaris has run the National Human Trafficking Hotline, there have been 50,000 cases um, of human trafficking reported. Um, and then, of course, on the bottom left, human trafficking is now um, an, an, an internet crime. Um, uh, these are things that are, will be in your packets, um, part of the presentations. These are excerpts from the TVPA, which specifically indicate, um, and then we recognized 20 years ago, that trafficking uh, is an organized financial crime um, and an international one as well. Definitions of human trafficking in the US specifically, I do want to make a clarification that the Numbers that we quoted are specifically um, related to the U.S. definition of human trafficking. The international definition is slightly broader um, and incorporates more, and Rohit mentioned uh, the over 40 million um, people trapped in modern-day slavery today. Um, this is where we want to get to, right? Human trafficking and currently is high profit, low risk, and we need to get to a point where it is low profit, high risk, and so we're having that conversation. Roy. Without further ado, you. can you take us back? Yeah. So I, well, first of all, thank you so much, Angel, and thank you uh, for having this discussion at, at this important conference. So I'll take you back to 2003. I was a line assistant United States attorney here in Washington, D.C., <coughs> doing just general crime, your, your simple assaults, your, uh, your aggravated assaults, your uh, robberies and things like that when a DC police officer came to my office. Uh, I was then working in what was called the grand jury unit, so we just did intake for a large volume of cases. Uh, came to my office and said, hey, I have this woman who says that her pimp is beating her. And as a relatively young prosecutor, I said, I don't know what to do with that. Uh, I have no idea what you're talking about. And he said, no, she, she came to me, he worked on the, in the vice squad, which spent most of their time arresting women for engaging in prostitution. And, he's, and he said, 
she said that her pimp is beating her. And I said, well, okay, well, let's, let's bring her in and talk to her. And she told us this really horrifying story of what was happening, not only to her, but to a number of other uh, young women and, and girls. About two days later, the same officer came back and said, another woman has come asking for help because she is being physically assaulted by her pimp. So now we have something even bigger than just a, a, a single assault, a single pimp, a, a, a pimp that's just you know, mistreating one person. We called the FBI, DC police, FBI, and then me just kind of believing that I wanted to be more of a, a real law enforcement officer, not just a, an attorney, decided to go on and, for the execution of the search warrant. Stunned to find there they were in a house. There were about five young women in the house. Um, but beyond that, we got into the records. And there's a, in the, the lingo, there is the pimp, and then there's a person called the bottom bitch. And that person is the number one or top woman in the uh, prostitution game, as it would be, working for the pimp, controlling the women. In this situation, the pimp's name was Gary Gates, also known as Sweat. The woman's name was Tamisha Hayward. This is his top uh, deputy. The top deputy, it turned out, was keeping unbelievable records of everything that they had been doing. So this wasn't just a street operation. They were on, uh, at that point, they were advertising on the internet. They were advertising in newspapers uh, as, a, as an escort service. They had, in this apartment, uh, in this actually it was a town home, uh, they had receipts for everything. She had file folders with receipts for every pair, piece of clothing that they bought for the girls, every meal that they bought for the different girls, lists of what turned out to be over 30 different girls who had worked for Gary Gates. Um, they had credit card machines where they were running um, the, the credit information for the Johns. They had all of their transportation receipts. They had uh, basically this enormous amount of financial information that they were keeping from this uh, illicit trade that they were engaged in. Uh, thankfully, uh, Ms. Hayward was a very well-organized person and, and probably had she chosen a different life could be attending this conference in a different way, uh, but she chose this life. Uh, it turned out that he was prostituting girls as young as 14. Uh, he was pulling them from, from Baltimore, uh, from Virginia, from D.C. Uh, they were traveling all over the DMV area, uh, and he was making, uh, we found in their bank account at the time, uh, $35,000, uh, which is how much they, they'd had at the time. Uh, it ended up that, that uh, Gary Gates pled guilty to the crime uh, after we basically showed him all of the different women who we had found and identified and said, that he had physically and sexually abused them over a period of years in, in some instances. Uh, and so he pled guilty and he got eight years. Tamisha Hayward, his number two, got three and a half years uh, for what they had done. But that was my introduction to trafficking, uh, which I never understood. I never saw it as, as much of anything uh, until you actually deal with the survivors of it and you see them face to face and you realize that there are 14 year old girls out there, even 13 year old girls out there, whose oftentimes mothers sell them into the prostitution trade. And Roy, um, you know, this really drives home the fact that, you know, this is a business first and foremost. Um, how did the records that you mentioned, how pivotal of a role did that play in the prosecution of the case and putting the case together? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, the the importance of the financial aspect of this was that it, it, it was a business. I mean, these, these girls, uh, some of them, when you first approach them, they talk about how much they are in love uh, with the pimp who is abusing them and how it is a relationship and how the stable, which is the group of girls who are together or young women who are together, how they love them like sisters. It is the financial piece of this which makes it clear that this is not just any kind of, of, of relationship. This is a relationship whereby through force, fraud, coercion, uh, the pimp profits off of selling these girls and young women. You also realize that the young women have nothing. The clothes are owned by the pimp. Uh, the pimp decides when and if they are going to be allowed to go out and get food. 
uh, and he provides them with the cash to do so. The bottom is waiting outside of the room to collect the money uh, when the girls are done. It is a, it is 100%, well, I wouldn't say 100%, it's 90% it's financial, it's 10% just pure power uh, over another human being. But the financial aspect was, a, was an enormous part of it. That's what drove the pimp. That's what drove the bottom uh, to engage in these acts. And Jane, I know I see you nodding because I know you have some very strong opinions about um, kind of the, the role that financial records play and also the evolution of the type of evidence we're seeing in human trafficking cases today. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, thank you, Angel, and thank you for having me. Um, everything that Roy said is absolutely true um, even now. And being a trial attorney in the Department of Justice and having the opportunity and the honor to speak with all of you, uh, about the financial investigations and how important they are in human trafficking cases is, is really, we've come a long way. Um, I started working on human trafficking cases when I was a student attorney um, in law school in uh, the University of Michigan Law School's Human Trafficking Clinic. At that time, it was one of the only um, law schools that had a clinic exclusively focusing on victims of trafficking. And about 10 years ago, the focus was encouraging AUSA's local prosecutors, law enforcement, to think about victims of trafficking as victims. What does victim-informed or survivor-informed investigations and prosecutions look like? Whether it's sex trafficking or forced labor, these cases are really difficult. Any case where you have a victim and the case is about proving the coercion or how the victim feels, any evidence you can put in front of a jury or a judge to educate them on what this is, which is the commoditization of victims who are vulnerable in some way and are being exploited by their traffickers and the trafficking networks, that's where the financial piece comes in, to corroborate their stories, to make it believable, not because we don't believe the victims, but to show the entire picture and how vulnerable they are, both by the lack of money that they're actually making and how they don't have liberties, but also the tremendous amount of revenue that's generated by this, uh, whether it's sex trafficking or forced labor, for the defendants, and we want to deprive them. Angel um, alluded to my work on forfeiture and restitution. The statutory language in the United States is very clear that for victims of sex trafficking and forced labor, forfeiture and restitution is mandatory. In order to show how much revenue and illicit profit the defendants get, that's where we need to work with the financial institutions. And that's where the financial piece of showing how much money is being made, where the money is going, who's actually gaining the, the profit and how they're using it in comparison to how the victims are living and what they need, the support they are going to need after they are rescued is so critical. And um, often in the uh, money laundering section, and again, I think MLARS in the department uh, feels very strongly about the importance of doing financial investigations as part of human trafficking cases, is because we would like to also go after what we call our gatekeepers or third party money launderers who are the facilitators for the traffickers, whether it's your accountants or the lawyers or the bankers who will allow and profit themselves by helping the traffickers or the trafficking networks gain and distance themselves from the financial transactions. Roy alluded to the bottom. I like to think about the lawyers and the bankers and the accountants who help the trafficking network profit and distance themselves also as culpable as the bottom in a sex trafficking case because they're profiting by allowing the traffickers to victimize more individuals and then get away with it potentially because they've 
put in these third layers or secondary layers that make it more difficult for prosecutors and law enforcement to identify them. And so collaboration between law enforcement, prosecutors, the financial um, system is so important and critical to the work that we do on a daily basis in these cases. Yeah, and we're gonna talk a bit, a little bit more um, about kind of what that financial institution's role is. And, but before we move um, on from kind of the prosecutorial mindset for a minute, um, you know, can you just take a minute to talk about what the, what the role of the internet has played? You know, we live in a world of Epstein, we live in the world of Backpage, we live in the world of R. Kelly, right? Um, how has that evolved the mindset of evidence in prosecutions? Sure, so internet, obviously everyone has a phone and computers and there's a new app, app that is developed om almost on a daily uh, basis. Um, and there is um, a lot of talk about um, recruitment or enticement of children, um, whether it's on an app that seems pretty innocuous like Instagram, uh, or in cases like Facebook with messaging where um, parents may not have access to what their children are looking at. Um, unfortunately, what has also happened, um, we talk a lot and there's a lot of discussion about encryption and how that affects law enforcement's ability to um, identify victims, proactively investigate cases. But the other piece of it, and we learned um, about this after the indictment and the takedown of Backpage, is that there are new advertising websites that are facilitating trafficking. And from a financial perspective, what, why financial institutions and that information is so critical um, to us in law enforcement is because now the servers are being hosted overseas. And um, within the Department of Justice, the child exploitation and obscenity section works a lot on child exploitation, sex tourism cases. And what makes that difficult is the money is now also overseas or in countries that may not be as friendly uh, with law enforcement in providing that information. And so we use the EGMA and FinCEN and work um, through other Department of Treasury um, avenues to find more um, creative ways to identify where the trafficking networks money is, but also where they're hosting the servers and operating these advertising websites. So as the um, defendants and our um, targets are becoming more sophisticated, I always like to say we need to be creative, we need to use all of the tools in our toolbox and work across, you know, not just within the department, but with the financial institution, other departments within the government to help make a difference and, and combat this crime much more um, creatively and thinking critically about what we can do, not just being in a silo of this is a sex trafficking case, this is a forced labor case, this is only happening in DC. And I think there's kind of this movement to the convergence of financial transactions with tech the rise of fintechs, the ability to transfer funds to and from in a lot of different platforms, the increase of use of cryptocurrency or virtual assets, um, all things that I think are going to create both challenges but also opportunity um, to find those breadcrumbs along the way. So we've mentioned financial institutions numerous times and the concept of following the money, and I think we've talked through a lot of these um, points. So I want to um, go to Rick. Um, because as we think about financial institutions, obviously um, many of us in the anti-financial crime space uh, rely very heavily on the BSA, the USA Patriot Act, and we're in a very interesting time um, in this conversation. Um, and I just pulled down um, FinCEN's timeline of the history of the BSA and USA Patriot Act, and I was comparing that against Rick's bio. And one of the things that um, kind of came to me, and I guess I should have known this before, um, is that at every pivotal moment that we, you know, you see on this timeline, right, um, the, in 2000, and, not, and even before 2001, but um, all of the changes in regulations, all of the things that, we, conversations we've been having around policy, um, Rick really was at the center of a lot of it, whether it was in government, <laughs> 
or at a financial institution or talking to regulators. Can you talk to us um, a little bit about the financial landscape, the tools and methodologies we have in place? Sure, and, and Actually, I do want to note that the timeline starts in 1970. So yeah. I, Rick was only I guess five. that's when you started. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm only 25. Can you amazing, imagine, right? Amazing how you did that. I know, I know. So I just to put a context on that, I really got into this space in the 80s. So, um, uh, but yes, and you know, I think it's a great point because. When the Bank Secrecy Act really started to take steam as a tool for prosecution or investigations of potentially illicit activity, it was really around cash coming into banks. I mean, think about that, because while we still have those requirements to watch it today, we're, that, that's, at least in my opinion, that's the least of our concerns today is around bulk cash coming into banks. I mean, it just doesn't happen anymore in an illicit fashion. Um, so that's, that was the, the means that the Bank Secrecy Act was used at the beginning, and there were um, several prosecutions around that, uh, but there were also actions against banks. And so if you think about sort of the, the change in approach, it was there were, there were actions against banks for not following the requirements to identify large amounts of cash that were coming into banks. We never see that today. So we will sometimes see a bank being called out for having some lax control in their currency and transaction reporting requirements. But you don't see a prosecution of a bank for failure to understand what was coming in the bank via cash deposits. Um, so there has been a total shift in the way that we look at the regulatory scheme around um, managing money flow and illicit activity, um, I, I would argue that the heart of where we intersect and are able to provide added value as financial institutions is with suspicious activity reporting. With the proviso that a lot of us have been dragged in different directions on how to report potential suspicious activity and sometimes we lose focus not, on our, not, not because of our own doing, but because of changes in the environment and things like that, um, we sort of lose focus on some of the things that are more important. So if you take, if you fast forward to today um, or the last five or so years, one of the things that, that I've been a huge advocate of um, and a call out to John Byrne because we've been advocating this together is, for example, there have been challenges around whether or not there should be a specific requirement in the suspicious activity reporting methodology, if you will, to report human trafficking um, or some form of that. Um, I've been a huge advocate not to do that because then it becomes just a process and you don't get the financial institutions actually focusing on the underlying activity which might be of value to law enforcement. So there's, there's, there are a lot of regulations, obviously you can see on the page and, and when it comes up like this, it, it's kind of freaky. Uh, but we have a lot of things as banks that we have to do every day in order to ensure that we are complying with appropriate regulations and managing our risk appropriately. What, what you don't see that comes out of this is there are um, regulations and laws that will actually, that do actually help us be able to provide valued information. So it, to me it's not about just making the report, but it's about understanding what tools we have um, that allow us um, the ability to provide information to those that can do something with it. And, and I'll pivot for a moment on this because one of the other things that I think is a challenge, and, and Angel will remember because I think it was about 10 years ago now, um, we took a small team of analysts from banks um, and sat down with, with uh, uh, I, uh, Homeland Security at the time and talk through, we spent five days, if I remember correctly, 
And we said, if Homeland Security could bring agents that are actually working on cases that they believe may be connected in some way to human trafficking, so whether it was prostitu uh, prostitution, whether it was forced labor, whatever it was, if they thought they had a case that they were active on and could come and talk to us about what evidence they're seeing, and we could then look at the financial side, our thinking was, Together, we could help, number one, develop typologies, which you know, I think has been sort of 50-50, whether we are actually successful at doing that, but create a much better understanding on both sides as to what is necessary to get a prosecution together, but also what is necessary in terms of understanding the underlying activity. So I recall one example where the agent was saying, they're kind of curious because they see that a location where they're convinced that prostitution was occurring, they would see in the middle of the night um, and follow an individual who would take um, a deposit bag and do a night drop into a bank. And they didn't understand, I mean, they obviously understood what it was, but they didn't quite understand what happens after that. Now, from a bank perspective, it's just another deposit until we have that piece of information that maybe for some instances with some more information, we should be looking at what comes through a night drop and not just process the transactions. So those are the kinds of things that, that I think provide us some focus. But where I was going to pivot to is that one of the gaps, one of the significant gaps I think in this area, and more so on the forced labor side than on the straight out prostitution is, it's very difficult for a bank to distinguish between a legitimate business and a business that's using forced labor, obviously. But there are organizations like Polaris that have a slew of information about bad actors. And you know, call out to Sarah and others at Polaris, we've been, and, and I should say more they than us, have been attempting for the last two years or so to get legislation that would provide a safe harbor so that those NGOs like Polaris could give us bad actors. And then of course, and, and we've talked about this as you all know in the terrorist world for a long time, tell us who the terrorists or potential terrorists are and we will rip across our banks to find information. But without that lead, it's very difficult to move forward. So that is, with all of these laws and regulations and they do help us share. So you know, we've got 314Bs as you know, which allows banks to share back and forth between them. We've got 314As under the Patriot Act, which is allows or, or provides the ability for the government to ask banks about certain individuals. So there are ways to share information. Um, I, I would argue, though, that a lot of our sharing doesn't follow a regulatory scheme. It's because we are all committed and interested and we get together and talk these cases through. So I'll get off the soapbox for a moment. Yeah, and I'm going to go to James in a, in a minute on kind of, you know, things that we're, you're looking at specifically um, on the collaboration piece, but, but also I know you work a lot um, with Delta 8.7 and, and thinking about how to leverage data and intelligence generally. But before we go there, um, Rick, you know, we had a couple questions come in about, um, you know, how we can leverage intelligence. Uh, so, for example, um, there, there was a question about how recruiting methodologies and understanding recruiting methodologies um, can help banks monitor for human trafficking. And I know you mentioned topologies and, and understanding, like, what types of transactions we're seeing. And I think about that as contextual information, it, right? Right. And also the question about there, if there are phone numbers or if there are bad actors, you know, what are the types of things financial institutions would do? Right. So, so obviously, last point first, if there are bad actors and banks can find out about those in some way, that makes it um, a lot more productive for the bank to focus in on what we should be looking at. Because if, if somebody comes to me and says, 
you know, Angel, we think Angel is a bad actor, I will now look at Angel's accounts in a way that I didn't look at them before. And I think you would all, all of you that are in banks would agree with that. Just saying that there's a typology that A, B, and C happens and that might be connected to human trafficking or terrorist financing or other, th that hasn't been so successful. But when we have specific information about bad actors, we can react to that. So, so I, I'm much more interested in getting that information. The typologies, as I said, they, they, we've thought about it. I don't think they've worked all that well because, um, first of all, in the human trafficking space, some of the typologies that we developed really involve movement from bank to bank, and each bank has a part of it. And if those banks don't know to collaborate, then we don't have a trail to follow. Um, so I'm, I'm really focused and I've been pushing um, a lot of my friends that are still in the FBI or in Homeland Security or in Secret Service around whenever information can be shared with us, that really helps. And I know there's, uh, you know, there, there's still a fundamental flaw in the ability to share information because prosecutors and law enforcement are worried about harming their cases and I totally agree with that and banks are worried about providing information or talking to law enforcement without some protections and I understand that as well. Um, so I continue to look at ways that we can break those barriers and have those conversations and just a, a real quick antidote not in this space but um, two weeks ago, we got a, a criminal trial subpoena for an elderly abuse case um, down in southern Florida. Um, I got on the phone, cause the, the request didn't make a lot of sense to me, um, being a former prosecutor. Um, I got on the phone with the AUSA and I said, spend five minutes and tell me what the case is, and then I understand that you believe we have bank accounts that are related to this, but explain to me what it is you're looking to get. And we spent 20 minutes talking that through. I put one of my investigators um, on the phone with him to walk through what we had found. It was sort of a sea change in the way that he was thinking about the money movement and how he wanted to present it at trial. Um, and I think it will be very successful. So those are the kinds of individual engagements that I think will help us in this space specifically. So, you know, I wish, I wish back when I was a federal prosecutor, we even talked about this stuff. I mean, human trafficking wasn't a thing. I, I'm, it was happening, but it, it wasn't a conversation at all because I would love to have been able to prosecute, especially with the knowledge I have now from the financial sector side. Thank you. Um, and James, can you talk a little bit about the role of data and intelligence um, and technology is having today in this conversation? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a crucial role for, for data and intelligence to strengthen our ability to protect the integrity of the financial system. You know, we, we saw that number that you had in an earlier slide, that this is a $150 billion industry. That makes it the third largest uh, global crime by revenue after drug trafficking and trafficking in counterfeit goods. And yet, as Rick says, you know, we haven't really been talking about it. I think, I think there is a sea change going on thanks to the work of organisations uh, like ACAMS and others, uh, work of Timia and survivors, uh, to help us understand uh, how that data relates to the human reality that she lived through. And there's a real need for that ongoing partnership with survivors to, to bring the data to life and let us understand what's going on in the data. Um, we've been working as part of the Liechtenstein Initiative on finance against slavery and trafficking. Uh, which I represent, and I'm so pleased that we're, we're partnering with ACAMS. Thank you, Rohit, for the wonderful uh, introduction this morning. Uh, to think about how we can work globally on data sharing uh, and on policy learning from different countries. Uh, there's a number of different things going on around the world uh, that can help us all learn together and faster and move faster in this effort. Um, I'll come back to this point about typologies. Um, it is absolutely the case that our existing typologies are built on the data that we already have. So as a result, historically, we've found that those typologies are a little bit skewed towards sex trafficking and away from labor trafficking and towards the intersection of those types of activities with, in particular, retail and commercial banking, less intersection with correspondent banking relationships, less intersection with money service businesses. That's not because that 
the intersection isn't there, it's because historically we haven't looked for it, so we don't have the data on which to build the typologies. That's beginning to change. In the Netherlands, for example, there's a wonderful cooperation between their FIU, 13 banks and uh, three research organizations, to use artificial intelligence to find new indicators of labor trafficking hidden within those patterns of what would otherwise, as Rick said, look just like legitimate business. Uh, they found 26 different indicators, uh, and they're testing that now, and it's already led to a number of active prosecutions uh, at the national level. So there are tools we can use here, but we have to think about them in a sophisticated and, and textualized way. And I think it's very important that we you know, learn from what's going on in other jurisdictions as well and how policy frameworks can enable that data. So, for example, I might, you encouraged us, Angel, to be a bit interactive. I might, for example, take a little bit of issue with Rick's point about um, whether one should have a checkbox on suspicious transaction reporting. What we've seen in other jurisdictions that have adopted that approach is a 900 to 1,000% increase in the reported incidents from reporting entities to the FIU. Now, I, I don't disagree that that can very quickly turn into exactly what it sounds like, a checkbox exercise. But what it can also enable is the, the uncovering of the data that helps everybody then begin to understand what a non-checkbox exercise would look like and can strengthen the data cooperation, the development of typologies, and so forth. And I think there's a... Do you wanna... so, so I get a rebuttal? Yes, of course. <laughs> so point well taken. From a U.S. perspective, we're going to have a million and a half suspicious activity reports filed in 2020 at a minimum. This is J and there's no capacity for the United States government and no slight on anyone at all to manage through all of that. <clears throat> so when banks are focused on looking for activity and calling it out not because it's part of a process, you don't get 10, you get the one that is of importance. At least that's, that's been my perspective on this. Um, in a number of instances, and not, not just with human trafficking, I will pick up the phone and call somebody when I have something that I think is of significant interest in this space or any other space and not worry about the SAR filing. But I do think that for a lot of institutions that have a lot of requirements that they have to follow, the checkbox just says, well, you know what? It could be, it might not be, I'll check the box, I'll file it, uh, which is the right approach so you don't get into regulatory issues. So th that's my reasoning. I think in a lot of other countries that don't have the size of the financial sector that we do in the United States, that might make a lot of sense to, to have a requirement. And I think you know, there is a very delicate balance um, between getting data and getting the right data with which to build these topologies and intelligence. Um, and I think a lot of people kind of in the technology and data space just say, give me everything. I'll parse through that and I'll figure that out and we'll have that conversation. We'll reach out to the banks, we'll reach out to the investigators to say, hey, I see this anomaly, let's have a conversation about that. Um, and I think we have a long way to go there, but I think that conversation is starting. Um, we, uh, you know, have some questions about labor trafficking, and Roy, I know you wanted to talk about this, and everyone's already mentioned it at some point. Um, it is becoming a very, very specific focus in the U.S. Um, Roy, did you, can you give us a little bit of context around labor trafficking? Why has it been, um, you know, something that hasn't been at the forefront so much when we think about human trafficking in the U.S.? So I, I headed up, or I supervised the uh, the unit in the Civil Rights Division uh, that was working on trafficking cases, and we, we found that we were really doing much more in the sex trafficking space than we were in the labor trafficking space, an enormous um, difference. And, and then similarly with Polaris, we, we've seen the same kind of thing where so much emphasis is being put on the sex trafficking piece and so little is being placed on the labor trafficking. And it's, there's just been a, a number of challenges with, for, first of all, what is sex and what is, what is labor? Uh, is, a, is a huge question, because if you look at kind of the street prostitution thing, it's really a combination of sex and labor. Um, the, the, the women are being forced out there to work. If we look at what's happening in the, in the numerous brothels and massage parlors, it's a real overlap between what is sex and what is labor. 
Uh, we usually think of, and most of the labor cases that we were finding were kind of the uh, international nanny uh, being brought over with a diplomat's family uh, and being forced to, to work and not being allowed um, out and, and having their, their travel papers held and taken. Uh, and a, and a, that was kind of most or, or a significant portion of the labor cases. When it came to kind of the agricultural and the, the, the big labor cases, one, they're just very, very difficult to, to bring together. Um, the other thing is, is a lot of the transactions are happening on the international side, and people are actually willingly paying someone to get them into the United States so that they can do this kind of work. Uh, and so it's often hard to identify victims because the victims actually wanted to get to the United States, and that was a, 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 main, a major focus of, of theirs. And so getting them to admit that they were forced into the United States or that their papers were taken or that their, their working hours and not getting paid uh, was not really of interest to, to many of the victims in those cases. So I, I, I raise this just to say that it's something that is ongoing. I have not seen a dramatic uptick in the number of prosecutions on the labor side. We continue to focus on the sex side. The, the sex side is, you know, to, to be punny here, sexier. Um, it is what, what drives a lot of the press stories. It, it's what, uh, what a lot of the organizations around, and there are, there, this is an area where there, there are more nonprofit organizations than I think in probably any other area, but most of them focus on sex trafficking as well. So it's an area that we need to do more on. I'm not sure if, if DOJ has improved uh, on those numbers, but it's something that we've struggled with for years. Yeah, and I do want to get to the collaboration uh, part of it. And James, I know you want to talk um, about uh, the, the project here. But um, really quick, Jane, can you sure. talk a little bit about what it, are there indicators of labor trafficking today? And are, what, from an evidentiary standpoint, um, what can financial institutions look for um, in labor trafficking cases? So I think, and I mentioned this before, I really don't like to talk about any form of trafficking as a silo. Um, I think that a real conversation that we're having in the department and sort of uh, with NGOs and financial institutions is looking at this as a transnational organized crime network, especially when you have young men um, being recruited from Guatemala or Mexico and who do want to come to the United States um, and are being helped get here through recruiting agencies and then exploited, um, whether it's in an agricultural farm or in construction. There are um, definitely efforts being made in certain cases that are currently being prosecuted throughout the country that are focusing more on the forced labor aspect. They're harder to identify the victims. Um, in some instances, you also, with the financial institutions, we really want to focus on the supply chain. And those cases can be difficult to prove if the victims are abroad um, here in the United States to bring those charges. But if we can follow the money, not to use a cliche phrase, but understand what those flows look like. Who's paying for the airlines? Who's paying to move individuals in the illicit massage businesses from one place to the other? Part of the importance of conducting financial investigations is in order to prove cases that otherwise we wouldn't necessarily be able to bring the forced fraud and coercion charges under a forced labor statute. That doesn't mean that we just let the targets or the traffickers walk away because we may have other tools. We may have tax charges to bring. We may bring money laundering charges. And that's where looking at how is the individual getting into the United States? Where are they living? Who's paying for their homes? Um, and often agents want to be in the field. And one of the amazing things about, and this goes to the collaboration, is we have a lot of other agencies like the IRS, US Postal Service inspectors, who can do a lot of the financial investigations part while you're doing the physical surveillance to understand are these men or women being housed together? Do you have a nail salon and a restaurant, both cash heavy businesses, but they're owned by the same people? Um, are, are the landlords just looking the other way because they're being paid in cash? Um, I want to touch a little bit about the SAR reporting because I deal with leads and I get calls. Talking to people is really important. It's important even if you're law enforcement to law enforcement 
in transnational organized crime cases in these illicit massage businesses and these forced labor cases where men or women are being moved from Georgia to work on farms in Ohio or Missouri um, or Wisconsin, it's really important that law enforcement speak to each other, that I as a trial attorney based in DC speak to the San Diego AUSAs, but it also means that someone in Bank of America or Wells Fargo knows to pick up the phone and call myself or the AUSA and say, look, we're seeing that 140 customers with Bank of America or Wells Fargo have one address listed and it's a PO box in a completely unrelated um, country or state and we see a lot of transactions. Those are things we want to know. It might not be, hu be human trafficking, but most of the time traffickers aren't just trafficking people. They might be involved in drug trafficking, they might be in, well, in weapons trafficking, and so we want to think about it as a global issue in the United States so we can prosecute them accordingly. Thank you. Um, pivoting to collaboration, um, I'm going to hand the clicker down there to James um, to take a few minutes to talk about um, the initiative uh, and then back to uh, Rick and Roy to talk a little bit about collaboration generally in, in the industry. Thanks, Angel. Yeah, I think that the bottom line here and what we're trying to achieve with the, the Financial Sector Commission, which has now spawned FAST, Finance Against Slavery and Trafficking, and you can learn more about that at fastinitiative.org. The bottom, the bottom line is around collaboration. How do we work together globally to equip each other with the, the data, the knowledge, uh, the tools, to be more effective in our efforts to tackle this problem. One thing I do want to emphasize is that there's a real commercial uh, reason to do this. It's not just a question of uh, being a good corporate citizen or effective law enforcement. There's growing financial and uh, regulatory risk for firms, including uh, uh, financial institutions that don't tackle this problem. We have disclosure legislation in California, also specific Modern Slavery Act disclosure legislation in the UK, in Australia, now under consideration in a number of uh, European and Canadian jurisdictions that requires large firms to find these human trafficking risks, not only in their supply chains, but in their lending and investment portfolios, and then take steps to address it. In Australia, just recently, one of the four largest banks lost its CEO, half its board, and a fair chunk of its share price as a result of finding by the AML regulator that there were 23 million violations, uh, some of them linked to child sex exploitation online overseas. So this is beginning to have real material risk and get the attention of the C-suite in a, in a quite strategic way. So this commission was formed by the governments of Liechtenstein, Australia, and the Netherlands, with a number of participating banks, financial institutions, anti-slavery actors, to think about how we can equip each other with that data, knowledge, and tools uh, to allow us to be more effective in, uh, in our work to achieve uh, better results. The result was a blueprint, which I believe is going to be distributed in the break, and you can find it on FAST Initiative, with these five goals, five different areas, uh, each with six different actions. I think we have them on the next slide in extremely small print, uh, but you can find that online. Uh, three things per goal, three actions you can already undertake right now, zero barriers to entry, the tools are available, the uh, processes are known, three things you can do in each of these areas. And the ones that are most relevant to AML and compliance are those first two, compliance with laws, goal one, and goal two, knowing and showing uh, human trafficking risks in your, in your business and in your business relationships. So that means also your lending and investment relationships. And then the right-hand column are three initiate actions or three reach actions where further work is needed to make sure we have strengthened tools and capabilities. Uh, so for example, if you look at the very top right there, one of those actions is about developing transactions analysis tools, exactly as we were talking about earlier on the panel. How do we strengthen the tools we have uh, to make sure that we're actually finding the cases of human trafficking in all of its uh, glory is probably the inappro most inappropriate word in this, in this case, but to find those labor trafficking cases buried in the third or fourth tier of the supply chain of a firm that we're, that we're banking, for example. 
so there's a lot going on. We're, we're very pleased to be working with ACAMS and to have the ACAMS pledge, which gives you as ACAMS members the opportunity to indicate your commitment to work towards these goals. Uh, ACAMS is developing in a very exciting fashion and rather quickly to uh, a human trafficking online certificate, as Rohit mentioned, that will be uh, available free of charge to help equip uh, members with the knowledge and the tools to undertake this work. And you can find other uh, implementation tools already available online at FAST Initiative, including a risk mapping tool and a tool that we developed with the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which provides financial investigations advice based on about 20 different uh, documents that have been published in the last five or six years looking at how to do uh, financial investigations in this space. Uh, here is a little animated slide showing us the implementation uh, toolkit. This is the risk mapping tool. You can go online and work through a series of questions to begin to understand where might your bank or your financial institution potentially be exposed to modern slavery and human trafficking risks. It's just a starter to get, get your feet wet and help you understand which risks may be most salient and, and potentially most material for you. So we're really excited to keep working with ACAMS in the months ahead, and we'd love to hear from any of you uh, that want to be part of this initiative, or indeed the initiative we have to provide survivors access to bank accounts. We're working with uh, 13 banks around the world, including Truist and others here in the United States, Survivors often find that once they escape, they have struggled to get access to bank accounts because their name is associated with a red flag or because their bank account has actually been deliberately hijacked by a trafficker as a vehicle for money laundering. So it's very important to find ways to give them the chance to get back on their feet. If you don't have a bank account in the modern day and age, even if you have a job, it's frankly pretty hard to maintain a stable existence. So that financial inclusion is a really key part of, of the answer here as well. Absolutely. We have, again, this is a human problem, um, and a lot of the work that we're doing is really based in trying to um, bring that element back um, and focus on, on the humans involved in this. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, Rick, uh, you know, when I think about the space and, and the role of the financial institution, I think about, you know, transactions, topologies, intelligence. Um, the things that I'm putting up on the, the slide now are all resources that financial institutions, law enforcement, um, anyone who's in the anti-financial crime space have to think about how, how do we create programs in place, right, to, to help tackle this. Um, and these are all the different types of partnerships and organizations, and this is not all of them, right, that are focused on financial disruption to eradicate human trafficking. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, you know, how we leverage all of this intel and how we can turn that into topologies? And I know we only have a few, less than a minute left. <laughs> <laughs> so, so real quick, I, I, so the FAST program is great. Um, not, not to be negative, but the issue that I still see that we are missing is all these toolkits are really, really good at understanding, but we're not getting enough specific information to be able to react. So when you look at you know, things like you're doing business with high, with high risk entities, that could be money laundering, terrorist financing, human trafficking, fraud. So one of the things, and, and a call out to Angel because she is the creator of this, um, what Kieran mentioned with STAT, is bringing a lot of this information together. So specific information when it's available about cases, about victims when they're willing to um, provide some information, where then, uh, and it's a partnership of law enforcement, financial institutions, um, and uh, not-for-profits like Polaris, bringing this information together in a way that becomes useful for financial institutions to have specific information is really critical because it's very hard for us to act in a, in, in one quick example, and, and it goes back to, James, what you were just talking about. So in a lending relationship, you know, we could have a banker 
um, executing on a loan for a client have no idea that that client is engaged in labor trafficking. It's a valued business that is producing revenue and a very good credit risk for the bank without any knowledge. So the more specific information the banks can get on bad actors and activity that stands out um, as opposed to activity that seems to be normal is super helpful. And that's why I think the STAT program is really going to help as well in collaboration with these others. Well, and I think it's tackling the issue at, from all sides, right? As we learn more about different organizations who are trying to, again, focus on that financial disruption, um, we all have to work together because we're looking at things high level, we're looking at things super specific, um, and it's about being able to continue that conversation and talk through that. Um, and one thing I will say, you know, we talk a lot about public-private collaboration. One of the areas that we really are needing to focus on now is public, nonprofit, private collaboration. Um, Roy, I know you serve on the board of Polaris. We have a lot of fun doing that. Um, you know, can you talk just for one second about, you know, how Polaris is, you know, kind of focus and a strategy really has brought this concept to life? So in one second, <laughs> no, no. Um, I mean, basically the, the idea is that we have to collaborate and we have to collaborate across all of these. I mean, it, trafficking is considered something that is hidden in plain sight. And the problem is, is that everybody has little bits and pieces of information and we need to bring all of that information together to, to, to come to a solution. And so we need the survivors at the table, we need the financial institutions at the table, we need law enforcement at the table, we need the nonprofits at the table. And one thing that Polaris does and a lot of these organizations do is to bring all these people to the table so that we can actually figure out what are the clues so that when you are back at your financial institution, you actually have something more than just a, a, a checkbox that says, well, this seems weird, but you actually have information that says this seems weird because of and here are the following things that are identified. I got the Karen T, so I will end it there. Um, Can I, I'm sorry, Karen, I just wanna make one last plug. So, so I, I really wanna go from a conversation around victims to survivors, and one of the things that we've done, and I would encourage all the banks in the room to do, whether you join the FAST program or you work directly with NGOs, is look for ways to open up bank accounts, as, as was mentioned, for survivors. And don't get enamored or stuck in all the regulatory requirements. I have to have a driver's license. I have to do something else. There are ways to manage through that, to manage the risk and open up an account. Basic checking account, a credit card with a small limit. These are ways that survivors actually become survivors and are back in the community. So I, I would really strongly encourage, we've been working with Polaris directly um, and with Sarah on identifying NGOs in our footprint where we can go out and see if we can help by opening up some bank accounts. So I would just really encourage you all to do that. And sorry, Karen, sorry, Angel. And there are two specific questions that came in. Talk to Jane, talk to Sarah, for the people who have the question about the U and T visas and, and who to contact in law enforcement about ASAR. Thank you so much. Sorry, Karen.